Sprott Money is a leading precious metals dealer selling gold coins, silver coins, and bullion bars online. As one of Canada's largest owners of gold and silver bullion, the company's goal is to facilitate ownership of precious metals no matter how big or small the portfolio. Own the only real monetary assets, physical gold and silver bullion. I'm Ellis Martin. Join me now for another exclusive interview, this time with Eric Sprott, chairman of Sprott Money Limited. Mr. Sprott has earned a recognized standing not only as one of the world's premier gold and silver investors, but also as an expert in the precious metals industry. In addition to chairing Sprott Money, Eric is CEO, CIO, and Senior Portfolio Manager of Sprott Asset Management LP and Chairman of Sprott Incorporated. He has been stunningly accurate in his predictions, including foreseeing the current financial crisis. He chronicled the dangers of excessive leverage as well as the bubbles that the Fed was creating while correctly forecasting the tragic collapse of the housing and financial markets in 2008. Eric's prediction on the state of the North American financial markets has been captured throughout the articles that he authors titled Markets at a Glance. And today, we're pleased to have him on the Ellis Mart Report. Eric, welcome to the program. Ellis, uh, happy to be here. Now, with gold near the mid-1600s after a significant pullback, it's still higher year after year after year for the past several years. Why have we not seen some sort of parity or anything close between bullion prices and gold stocks, in your opinion? You know, there's a lot of people talk down gold, and unfortunately, the commodity markets, in particular the COMEX, had a lot of volatility in it, in the precious metals. I mean, we saw, for example, on Feb 29th, you know, out of nowhere, fell by $100. Those of us who are students of those markets realize that, for the most part, it's people selling silver and paper gold, and they can, in the very short term, can have a material impact in the market. In fact, it's, it's interesting. You might have noticed that the, when the, the BATS company went public, the, uh, the alternative stock exchange, that the high-frequency traders and the algorithmic traders took the stock from 16 to zero in about 10 minutes on their own exchange. It just shows how kind of out of control some of this paper trading can be. And I, I think the fact that gold is volatile, as has as silver, even more so, and the fact that the prices have weakened off their highs, it's kept people a little bit on edge regarding the uh, precious metal stocks. And I think until we have sort of a proven rise in precious metals, people are going to kind of hold their powder until they see a sustained rally, and I think that's really worked against the gold stocks for one. And the other thing is that there's competing products to stocks, and we're one of the uh, perpetrators in the sense that we have these silver and gold physical trusts, which each of them this quarter has raised $350 million for a total of $700 million into the physical metals, and I think if those weren't quite as popular or not available, then people to participate would be in the stock. So we've been a little bit of our own worst enemy on that side of it as well. Speaking of that, I'm one of the 99 percenters who's collecting silver at near $30 instead of 20 or 10 like I perhaps should have. I've got a real thirst for it. Sooner or later, to use your words, physical silver buyers are going to overwhelm the sellers. What happens then? Well, that's a good question. Some people have postulated that you know, there's just defaults on the COMEX because you have all these outstanding contracts and there's, of course, no possible way of settling them through physical delivery because the outstanding position is something like 500 million ounces and we produce 900 million a year. In fact, there's days it trades between 500 million and a billion ounces in a day, even though theoretically for investment purposes there wouldn't even be a million ounces a day available for investment. Someday I just think the physical, both in gold and silver, the physical demand on the buy side will overwhelm the sellers and ultimately be at the fault somewhere. So you don't see these mining companies ever be able to cover anything close to that? Even if I was just to take, for example, the difference between 2010 and 2011. In the case of the gold market, which is the best example, it's a 4,000 ton a year market, which includes mine supply of roughly 2,700 tons and perhaps 1,300 tons of recycled material. And that number of 4,000 stayed constant for about the last 12 years. It's hardly moved at all. And yet from 10 to 11, we saw a difference of approximately 800 tons of buying, net new buying, from central banks and China. And I always went, well, who didn't get to buy the 800 tons that these participants are now buying? Did the gold coin buyers not buy it? No. Did the Chinese retail people not buy it? No. Did the ETFs not buy it? No. So who's not buying the gold? The only explanation I can give for the shortfall being met is that central banks are surreptitiously selling gold into the physical market and that there is an excess of demand over supply already. And I think this is why certain countries
countries now are, are questioning the policy of lending their gold. And I include in those Switzerland, Germany, Venezuela, of course, took back their gold. And other countries saying, well, maybe we should have the gold in our own country because it shouldn't be in some other country because we don't know what's happening to it. So I can't begin to explain where the gold comes from other than central banks are continuing to what they call lease gold. And when you lease gold near a central bank, theoretically you haven't sold it for accounting purposes. But the physical product is gone because it's been consumed by somebody who's not likely to sell it back to you. Well, then what we've got is virtual gold, which is worse than paper money. Totally. You lease gold to somebody and you say, well, I'd like to get it back. And then the guy's got to go to the market, and the market demand exceeds supply. Goodness knows what happens to the price, and or the guy just reneges. What are you more excited about now, silver or gold? Well, I've been more excited by silver for the last two years. I base that on things I see going on in the silver market, and I'll give you a couple of examples of that. The first example would be you look at the U.S. Mint sales, which are available on their website pretty well every day. For all of 11, the amount of dollars invested by the coin collectors in silver has been equal to the dollars invested in gold, which means that we bought 50 times more physical volume of silver than we have gold. But physical silver supply is only about 11 times that of gold per year. And if I was to put it in what's available for investment, because a big part of silver goes into industrial uses, the ratio is about six to one. Like there might be six times more silver available for investment than gold, but people are buying it at a 50 to 1 ratio. The other example I could give you, Alice, is that when we, for example, did the last two tranches of our gold and silver trust, we raised exactly the same amount of money in each trust, 350 million each, 349. That means we bought 50 times more silver than we bought gold. There's lots of examples of that where you see the average person being equally disposed between putting the same amount of money into silver and gold, but it can't continue to happen because it's not available in that proportion. Do you know who your customers are? Well, I don't know who all my customers are because when we do our trusts, I'm not aware of exactly who's buying it. Of course, I would know who our internal customers are, but I just have to imagine that it's, you know, the everyday guy out there who sees what's going on in the financial world and what I'm referring to is just this printing of money and the lending of money to the banks, the propping up of the system, governments buying their own bonds, and there's only one conclusion to reach, and that is that the value of the currency is being diminished every day, and how do you protect yourself? So there's enough of those people around that they've generated quite a bit of interest in gold and silver. What kind of opportunities are you taking advantage of now in this market? Well, unfortunately, I haven't seen a lot of opportunities in the last six months that have played out, but generally our thesis is we're happy to sell the commodity to buy precious metal stocks because I think the stocks have you know, seriously underperformed uh, the metals, and we think there'll be a, a snapback to that when people realize, one, we don't have an economic recovery in the world. In fact, we may be going into something quite the opposite to a recovery to use European data and Chinese data and things like that. And then also people who just see, you know, the continual suggestion that we're going to print more money, which theoretically Chairman Bernanke suggested a couple of days ago that, gee, maybe the data is not as strong as we think it is. We might not be out of the woods yet, and we might have to be more accommodative in uh, quotation marks. I think you actually stated that you believe we're in a depression. Is that true? Well, I, I see no I see no way out here. When I look at that, I look at the 99%, and I look at what the opportunities are for the 99% who must support the economy. <laughs> uh, you know, that's where most of your consumption comes from. But, you know, when you look at the wage gains versus the increase in cost of living, it just doesn't equate. We had an example of that that just announced in the UK where it said personal income on a, on a real basis had fallen 1.7%. And when your personal income falls on a real basis by 1.7%, that means your disposable income has gone down much more market because a lot of people's income is already slated to pay the mortgage or pay off the credit card or fixed utility charges and taxes and things like that. So there's not... At the margin, the disposable income is a lot less than gross income. So you start losing, on a gross income basis, the impact on disposable income is much more dramatic. No way out anytime soon, at least in the Western world. Well, to be brutally honest, I don't see it. I mean, I would say that pretty well all countries have called what's referred to as a Minsky moment. I mean, Minsky, an economist, said when you've expanded by increasing your debt, there becomes a point where your productive capacity can't pay off the debt. 